Hello everyone, welcome to HIM 216. This is the third in a series of lectures covering this chapter. In your textbook, please turn to page 35. And on the bottom of page 35, we're going to uh, begin with the um, UHDDS requirements for the reporting of other diagnoses. So they require, they define the principal diagnosis. They define the principal procedure. Those are required reporting. And from a reimbursement standpoint, we know that they affect reimbursement. Well, there are also other conditions or diagnoses that patients may have. And UHDDS gives us guidance on what to report. So basically, they tell us that if a patient has a condition that coexists at the time of admission, we report it, meaning we code it. So <clears throat> if a patient has um, COPD or they're a diabetic or they have hypertension, that's a condition that coexists. If they come in with a fractured femur and they also have a fractured ribs or a fractured wrist, uh, we also code those. We code conditions that develop after admission. So let's say that the patient comes in and has surgery, has a hip replacement, and then after surgery they develop pneumonia. Well, we would report that condition. Then we also uh, report conditions that affect the treatment. So if a patient is a diabetic, that certainly could affect their treatment. If we have a patient that comes into the hospital for, um, let's say, pneumonia, and for some reason they develop acute renal failure, uh, certainly that's something that we report. And also conditions that affect the length of stay. So any condition that a patient may develop or that a patient has at the time of admission and it impacts the length of stay, that's a condition that we would report. Um, there are other conditions that are re de uh, reportable. Um, they are additional diagnoses and they affect patient care because they may require clinical evaluation such as testing or a consultation or observation of a status. Um, they may require therapeutic a treatment such as medications or um, different therapies or even surgery or we may have to perform a diagnostic procedure to determine an underlying cause for a condition um, that a patient has. They may extend the length of the hospital stay because they have to be investigated or monitored or have continuing um, nursing evaluation. Um, they may require nursing care, not necessarily a physician treatment, and they may have conditions that need to be monitored. Now, Sometimes uh, patients have previous conditions that are documented. Uh, sometimes they're part of a, a discharge summary or the history and physical, but they might not be applicable to that patient's uh, current stay in the hospital. Um, the hospital may have a policy that requires that they be coded, and there may be an appropriate V code. And V codes are a classification of codes that are conditions that affect the patient's status, but may not be, but are not current conditions that the patient has. For instance, if a patient had cancer in the past, but they don't currently have cancer, we can't code cancer because they don't currently have it. However, there is a personal history of cancer code that we can apply, and that code is a V code. It begins with a V, and you'll become very familiar with, um, with those codes. <clears throat> Um, in your textbook, I want you to look on page 36, and I want us to look at this first example. 
So it says, this example says tells us that during the hospital stay, the patient develops a low sodium level. So their sodium level drops. And the physician makes a note of this condition, and he documents that he is going to continue to obtain lab values and to watch this. So this is an example of clinical evaluation. So there should be a diagnosis associated with this of hyponatremia. And so the fact that this patient, this is just an example of clinically evaluating a condition that a patient has. If we look at the next example on page 36, the physician documents that the patient has a past history um, of a seizure disorder. When you look at the medication list, you can see that the patient is on Dilantin. So this patient currently has a seizure disorder. It's not a past history, it's a current condition that they are receiving a treatment for in the form of that medication. And so in this instance, we would actually code the seizure disorder. And then the third example on page 36, the patient comes to the emergency room with pain in the leg after falling down the stairs. And so they perform an x-ray and it determines that patient has a fracture of the tibia. So certainly this is an example of when um, a procedure being the x-ray was performed to clinically evaluate the patient's complaint of pain in their leg. So then certainly we would, we would be coding the fracture of the tibia. We would not be coding the pain in the leg. But actually there's an external cause code that we would use for the fall down the stairs. If we go to page 37 and we look at this first example, the patient submitted with acute bronchitis. They were admitted two years ago for an appendectomy. They have a history of shingles. In the discharge summary, the physician documents the acute bronchitis, status post appendectomy, and history of shingles. So the only condition that's really relevant in this admission is the acute bronchitis. Now, we can code personal history of um, the shingles or the, um, the herpes for that. For the appendectomy, the way that we would reflect that is we would have to use an absence <clears throat> code. And, and I'll show you how to find those codes when we get into the code book. But we actually go to absence, appendix, and acquired. Is it relevant? Does it really contribute to this particular treatment for acute bronchitis? No, it does not. So typically it would not be coded. Now if we look at the next example, the second example on page 37, this patient is admitted with benign prostatic hypertrophy or BPH. Um, the patient is going to have a transurethral prostatectomy. So diagnosis, benign prostatic hypertrophy, the procedure, transurethral prostatectomy. Um, the anesthesiologist evaluates that patient in the preoperative area and he notes that the patient has mitral valve prolapse and has to be placed on antibiotics before undergoing dental procedures. And that's, you know, if you have mitral valve prolapse, uh, sometimes for patients that have certain kinds of implants, they have to take antibiotics before dental procedures. So the fact that the patient has mitral valve prolapse and requires antibiotics is a significant factor for the anesthesiologist. So that is a condition that's under clinical evaluation by the anesthesiologist and is being treated um, simultaneously. So we would actually code the fact that this patient has mitral valve prolapse. Our principal diagnosis is the BPH. The mitral valve prolapse is an additional diagnosis that we will add for this patient. <clears throat> Now in the next example, the patient's admitted with acute appendicitis. And um, the anesthesiologist and the preoperative consultation show that the patient has a history of COPD. 
chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is a progressive condition. We'll study it in um, our respiratory chapter. So the acute appendicitis and the COPD are both coded. COPD is a chronic condition. It affects the patients for the rest of their lives. And so it certainly has to be monitored. This patient could be um, compromised from a respiratory standpoint. So the fact that they have COPD does not change the principal diagnosis, which is acute appendicitis, but it is a chronic condition that we also code when we're coding this. Now, when we're looking at integral versus non-integral conditions, if a condition is integral to the disease process, we do not assign a code. Um, if the condition is a sign or a symptom, it's usually integral and we do not assign a code. But if it's not associated with the disease, even if it's a sign or a symptom, we do code it. Now students will often say, how do I know what's integral? And you can use the Mark Manual. And actually within 3M, which we'll be going over in a week or so, we um, you'll go through a tutorial that will take you into 3M. And one of the great things about 3M are the resources that they have. And one of those resources is a Merck manual. And when you go into that Merck manual and look at a disease process, it tells you what the signs and symptoms of that disease process are. So for instance, <clears throat> If you have a patient that has um, pneumonia and you go and you look up pneumonia, it will tell you what the signs and symptoms are. Chest pain, cough, fever, those kinds of things. If you actually look at the codes for chest pain, cough, and fever, they actually code to a chapter in ICD-10, which is the sign and symptom chapter. And so that's a big clue that you uh, would not assign one of those codes as well. But for instance, if you're a patient with chest pain and pneumonia, also happen to have pain um, in their foot, pain in the foot is not integral to pneumonia. And so if that was documented and there was no definitive diagnosis, you would assign a code for pain in the foot. So let's look at this fourth example on page 37. Patient comes in with a cough. Um, the, uh, they do an evaluation and the physician determines that the patient has pneumonia. Cough is a symptom of pneumonia. It's not coded. And the next one, the patient comes in with fever and an elevated white blood count. They do a blood culture, it comes back positive, and the physician determines that the patient has sepsis. In this case, we only call the sepsis. The fever and the elevated white blood count are symptoms of sepsis, and they are not coded. If we look at the last example on page 37, the patient comes in with metastatic brain cancer, and they're having that um, lesion surgically removed. The patient history rev reveals that the patient has had lung cancer that was and the lung was surgically removed and now they're coming in with seizures, metastatic brain cancer and a headache. In this instance the brain cancer is the principal diagnosis. That's the condition that's occas occasioning the admission. Um, the seizures and the history of lung cancer are coded as secondary diagnoses, but the headache isn't reported because it is a symptom of metastatic brain cancer. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, that is a, a very good example. On page 38, I want you to look at abnormal findings. So with abnormal findings. Now, where do we find abnormal findings in a medical record? Typically, they are in ancillary reports like um, radiology reports, EKGs, lab reports. With abnormal findings, we don't code them unless they are clinically significant. And clinically significant means that the physician has evaluated it and possibly provided treatment. So for instance, you look at lab work and you can see that the sodium is low. You look at the orders and you can see that the physician actually ordered 
uh, medication. He actually is treating that low sodium and he continues to do lab work to monitor it to see if it comes up. Um, there should be a corresponding diagnosis by the physician of um, hyponatremia and if there's not we have to generate a document called a query to ask the physician to clarify that for us. However, this is an example of an abnormal finding that you would be able to code. <clears throat> On another note, uh, you look at a chest x-ray and it says that the patient has consolidation. The physician never mentions anything about an abnormal x-ray. They don't do another chest x-ray. Um, it's just never addressed again. Is that something that you worry about coding? No, you do not. The physician doesn't address it. However, if you see a chest x-ray that says um, consolidation um, with um, Now let me do another example. The term just left my mind. So we're looking at lab work and we can see that the patient's hematocrit was abnormally low. Let's say the hematocrit was 32 and it's supposed to be 40 in their normal range. And the physician doesn't address it. He, he doesn't treat the patient. The patient isn't put on any medication for anemia and if you have a low hematocrit and hemoglobin. Usually it's an indication of anemia, but because the physician doesn't address it, because he doesn't treat it, we're not going to code it, and we are not going to generate a query to ask the physician about it. So we have to be very cautious when we're looking at these ancillary test results, and we can't get uh, really zealous and um, uh, assign codes uh, based on what we think the patient may have. Um, for this lecture, I, I want you to look at exercise 2-2 on page 38. So I want you to answer question 3, and then I also want you to answer question 9. So your two questions for this lecture are 3 and 9. And I want to talk to you about question 7. This typically is troubling for students. In this scenario, the patient has urinary retention after they have surgery. And this urinary retention is documented in the progress note. And then the physician writes an order and he wants the nursing staff to monitor or record the urinary output. So the um, nurses put in a Foley. So should the urinary retention be coded? If so, why or why not? And no, the urinary retention would not be coded. Um, it is not unusual for patients after surgery to have urinary retention. It is not unusual for uh, nurses to insert a Foley um, for a patient that has urinary retention. Only if this condition progressed to some acute renal failure or some type of urinary diagnosis that the physician, we can see the physician documents and treat, would we even consider coding it? So this is an example, no, we, and we would not have a procedure code for the insertion of that queer of that Foley either because that is a normal part of nursing care. That's going to conclude this lecture. Um, we'll have one more lecture for um, Chapter 2. If you have any questions, please contact your instructor.